Hello and welcome to episode 35 of the Cloud Computing for the C-Suite show with Brad Nelson, an internationally recognised and the world's number one cloud industry expert and thought leader, David Linthicum. This show is sponsored by Nelson Hilliard, cloud computing recruitment specialist, placing great people in cloud, IoT, fintech and AI. In this week's show, David and I will be talking about healthcare and that cloud computing will increase actual time information collection and improves accessibility to the facts, imparting extra pace and and efficiency in statistics handling. The healthcare cloud computing market is expected to exceed 11 billion US dollars by 2022. And make sure you stay until the end to get David's top three tips for how healthcare can leverage cloud to go to the next level. Hi Dave, it's great to have you on the C-Suite show this week. Yeah, it's great to be here. And I, I was amazed at the way in which you belted out that last uh, whole paragraph uh, unto itself. So uh, congratulations. Why, thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a bit of a mouthful, if I'm honest. Uh, but there we go. Such is, uh, such is our life every week when we do these shows. Um, so, look, I've got a great opening question for you, Dave. In your opinion, Dave, does this translate into better automation and better care, or do you think it will impact both? I think it's more about automation than uh, care, ultimately. I think that the healthcare world is, is adopting cloud and kind of fits and starts, but they're not necessarily leveraging it. Uh, down to the patient care clinical type system. So they are doing R&D around cloud, the grid computing, quantum computing, you know, things like that. And, and I think that's, that's all well and good because I want them to be doing lots of research so they can cure disease and get that out and save as many people as they can. But the reality is, is that if you're going to cure disease, you have to diagnose patients correctly, you have to manage them correctly, you have to do a lot of the blocking and tackling that it takes to basically get a patient in, checked in, uh, diagnosed, treated, and cured. And I see some stumbling points there. We're still dealing with old technology. We're, we're still not sharing information. We're still not dealing with uh, you know, EMR-based systems. And a lot of patients fall to the cracks in terms of their inability to kind of get the care that they think they need. And what frustrates me, you know, specifically when I deal with the healthcare world, is that all these things are solvable. And so you're able to basically process provide better care for patients at a much cheaper rate than you are right now, leveraging these you know, legacy systems, these uh, clinical, you know, packaged applications that they're really dependent on, things like that. It's a matter of re-innovating the way in which you think about care going forward. And I think a lot of the healthcare systems aren't doing that. I think they're maybe afraid of the regulations, they're afraid of, uh, um, you know, lawsuits, legal issues, things like that. But I think they got to start making some strides and being more innovative with this technology, not necessarily cloud computing, but machine learning, IoT based systems, you know, all these things that are available to us. You know, the, it seems like the Silicon Valley is being more innovative in the healthcare system, which kind of, you know, you know bothers me. I think that they need to be a step ahead in basically providing better automation, better capabilities. Good news is they are automating better. And so I, I can get built back faster and I can pay faster and all these things are really uh, in terms of the back office stuff, you know, are cloud enabled and the payers are leveraging cloud and the clinical systems are leveraging cloud, but not necessarily for interacting with patients, but it's back office stuff all the way. So it's a bit, you know, good news, bad news kind of scenario. Yeah, you're right. It's, I mean, we did a show a couple of weeks ago, I think, about um, healthcare and, and talking about the um, general practitioners of uh, uh, the, the, I think it was the UK general practitioners, how they've, they've put an um, artificial intelligent bot through the system and, and it actually outperformed the, the, uh, the actual physical doctors. So it's, it's one of those things where there's definitely that, um, that capability there, but it's the adoption, isn't it? It's getting that point of adoption that, that's really you know, the, the challenge at the moment. Like you say, people are still using older systems and, and things are you know, lagging behind. And I think there's, there's a huge amount with regards to what can be done with you know, storage of clinical statistics in hospitals and clinics that can be streamlined and fed into you know, machine learning algorithms that will be able to, in effect, you know, really provide the, the resources that people need and you know, saving lives, in effect, from, from what statistics have already proven, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, when I graduated from college, I was an artificial intelligent, artificially uh, an AI analyst uh, with my job at Boeing. And, you know, we were doing a lot of research into, into the ability to basically automate some of the stuff that healthcare does. And, you know, here we are, you know, years and years later, I could say three years later, I think no one would believe me, um, and not necessarily figuring out where 
the intersection is of this technology and applications into the patient care stuff. And I think there's a, a chasm, so to speak, between those that are innovating and the people who are delivering care. And the patient care providers, uh, not the payers, need to kind of rethink their their adoption of technology and their innovation with technology and need to get some innovative R&D kinds of systems going so they're really kind of taking things to the next level. And by the way, some are. There's some islands of, of innovation that's going on out there, and I'm seeing some you know hope and prayer in this area in terms of them improving the systems. But I'm not seeing leveraging the technology as a true force accelerator, which they need to do. And and the reality is that everybody's going to use a healthcare system at some point. We want the thing to work, and we want to have, you know, a, an automated experience where they're able to determine what's going on with us very quickly without sitting in a hospital for three or four days. And the way the healthcare system is now, it's very, very inefficient, very ineffective, and not necessarily able to get the care to the patients that I think the patients need. Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, that's what I've been reading. In fact, you know, I, I often think about the healthcare market and how you know technology is going to evolve into that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm probably if this is this idea is already out there, but you know, I'm, I'm envisaging within the next, you know, at least the next five years or sooner, drone doctors that are actually already preloaded with the software needed for you know areas that have been hit by you know natural disaster, such as like you know earthquakes or whatever it would be, where the drone doctor arrives and he's almost like a an onboard clinic that can diagnose people and know what resources need to be shipped in and maybe AWS or Amazon can facilitate the drop ship of what needs to be, etc. There's obviously got to be someone on the ground to administer and, and do whatever. But you know I think that's what I'm kind of thinking that that would be a cool thing. At least it's put drones to you know um, some sort of good use other than just delivering uh, packages or surveillance or blowing stuff up <laughs> well they already have drones that go into disaster areas that survey the areas um you know post uh, you know post the weather going away so they can look for uh, casualties and, and figure out how to assess people and they do have drones that fly in and will communicate with people and determine what's going on but you're right you know why can't they do an infrared scan of the person and MR, a quick mri in terms of what's going on and uh, make an assertion as to what the issue is and do a triage in terms of what patients need to be taken care of and dispatch, you know, we get better at it, dispatch some sort of an automated uh, robot, you know, to deliver the care. I mean, we've had tele telemedicine forever. We've had, uh, you know, machines that are that, that can um, extract prostates, you know, automatically without a doctor in, being involved. And uh, we just really need to trust this stuff and take it to the next level. And I'm ready to go. I mean, the reality is that I'm more trusting of a machine ability to kind of spot the details and take everything into consideration, considering machine learning, big data systems, things like that, than I am just a human that's going to basically make the same mistakes that humans do. There's some brilliant doctors out there and they um, do great diagnostics, but you know, ultimately they're, they're humans. I would rather get an, uh, an AI system involved, which is uh, basically replicating 10,000 expert doctors and, and making a decision as to whether or not, you know, I'm going to be treated correctly or not. And mistreatment, misdiagnosis, things like that, it's rampant in the healthcare space. We're spending billions of dollars a week on it. Yeah, a lot of money wasted. And, and to think it, it, it sort of uh, draws a new conclusion to the, the term, the flying doctor. Because you've got someone that, you know, yeah. is going to literally fly in and then report back in real time to a, a physician that's actually looking after that drone. So it's not just a drone as such that's just you know out there and it's automated. There's actually a real-time communication where it can be a virtual, a virtual drone that's doing, say, a, a blood test or a heart rate test, like you say, a, do a scan, an MRI or something like that. So look, I just, uh, I'm thinking outside the box because I think we have to, and you never know where these ideas are going to go. Uh, I just wish I had the money to invest in it myself and, and build that idea. <laughs> It's a great idea. In fact, I might even edit it out of the video just so it doesn't go viral. <laughs> <laughs> well, it leads us on nicely, Dave, to your, your top three healthcare leveraging the cloud tips. So uh, if you'd be so kind as to share those, that'd be great. Yeah, number one is, hey, providers, don't limit cloud to R&D. Um, so I see quantum computing, I see machine learning-based systems that are bound to R&D-based systems, things like that. 
it really should automate patient care. And, and there's some aspects of this that are going on, but not to the point that it really should be. So they're really dependent on the clin clinical systems to do um, the basic information sharing, things like that. They're overly concerned about some of the regulations that are out there. And it's really a matter of kind of stretching R&D to extend to the patient care kind of uh, system. So we're taking this technology where the technology needs to be. And while I'm all for R&D, basically developing systems, I'm all for automation of some of the back end systems. I really need these systems to be on the front line of patient care. Your point of you know leveraging a drone or some other kind of technology, that's technology we have today that if we purpose build it for this particular application, it's going to be able to go out there and save lives very quickly. And I can't imagine a more noble person purpose of a uh, automated system but to go out there and save lives. Um, don't be afraid to push the innovative edge. And I think we need to ask of the healthcare system to start doing this. And I, they're probably the people that should be the most innovative, but they're the least innovative in the space. We have the Human Genome Project, things like that. But there's more innovation that goes into figuring out customer behavior that walk into a retail store than figuring out patient care that, that as patients walk into a hospital. And it's a little concerning to me that that is. And I know the reasons for that. There's fear and, and uh, that the innovation is going to cause legal issues, things like that. It's not going to really translate into any kind of material gain. Uh, they may be outed in terms of death rates in hospitals. Some people fear the automation because of the information that's going to uh, basically put forth. And don't limit yourself to government limits. And so the HIPAA stuff, um, you know, all of the privacy stuff is all well and good. You have to stay in compliant. But the reality is, I think we have a tendency to limit ourselves too much in terms of how compliance is. So I always get misinformation in terms of what the limitations of HIPAA and other healthcare compliance issues are versus what is actually implementable in the cloud. And so understand that many of the issues or limitations that you think are there typically aren't gonna be there. Either they've been legislated out of the, of the standard uh, we have technology to be able to enable, you know, working with the standard in some sort of automated way. You know, let's not limit ourselves to these capabilities and quit using HIPAA as a blocker uh, for being innovative in this space. Uh, great top three tips there, Dave. Thanks so much for that. And thanks for being part of the C-Suite show this week. Oh, it's a pleasure. Go get your checkup. Thanks for watching. Really hope you enjoyed watching this week's C-Suite show with David Linthicum and myself uh, about the healthcare tech market. So look, remember to like, subscribe, comment, and share this video with your friends and colleagues. And you can get David on Twitter, which is at David Linthicum. I'm also on Twitter, which is at Nelson underscore Hilliard. Thanks again for watching. Until next week. <laughs>